when Arobri is here, and now we have arrived at the medieval period, and uh, the subject is Plotinus. Well, it's not exactly medieval, but well, almost. <laughs> almost. Well, anyway, we'd okay. like to thank you, and I would like to thank our host. It's a great and real pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't have the excuse of jet lag, even though my plane from Paris was extremely late, but I shall still read my paper. Uh, so the different contemporary criticisms, from Wittgenstein to Charles Larmor, of reflexive philosophy have in common that they all call into question the post-Cartesian idea ac according to which the self would have a privileged relation to, to, to itself. Such calling into question he invites to examine the articulation between self-knowledge, self-consciousness and interiority. Indeed, Far from being immediate or obvious, this articulation, which can be found in Descartes, is constituted. In Platonic philosophy, for instance, the injunction to self-knowledge, the Delphic precept, Gnotis Hotton, is dissociated from the ideas of immediate reflexivity and interiority. More generally, it has been shown that the ancient self was to be found not as much in the dimension of interiority and self-consciousness as in that of exteriority and manifestation. See, for instance, uh, Jean-Pierre Vernon, Jacques Brangevic, Michel Foucault, uh, Christopher Gill, and with the variations I can't develop here. So, uh, those pre preliminary remarks may help to better appreciate the singular position which, in this configuration, is that of Plotinus, and which I shall try to evaluate. This position can be characterized in the following way. First, Plotinus associates self-knowledge to interiority. But this interiority is not subjective, nor, and still less, intimate. It contains the very principles of reality, from the one good, the first principle, to nature. Second, the I, which Plotinus, and this plural is of course significative, calls the we, the hemais in Greek, the we does have an immediate access to himself. In other words, Plotinus does accept an immediate reflexivity, which is not the case uh, in Plato and Aristotle. But this self-consciousness is not self-knowledge. One has to distinguish between the subject of self-consciousness, that's to say the hemais, the we, and along with him the diagonia, and discursivity, the discursive reason, and the subject of self-knowledge which is the intellect and the separated soul. I shall finally uh, briefly uh, question uh, the conception of the self, which grounds uh, Pl Pl Plotinus' models of uh, self-knowledge and self-consciousness in order to elucidate his interpretation of the Delphic precept, know thyself. So I shall start with uh, self-knowledge in soul. The injunction to self-knowledge is right away articulated by Plotinus to the question of the one and multiple, and for this reason, right away graduated according to the levels of reality, soul, intellect, and the one good. Thus, the injunction only applies to an inferior degree of being characterized by multiplicity. I read a passage from treatise uh, 38 in the chronological order of composition, that is 6-7 in the uh, editing order of um, Porfiry, the editor of the Aeneas. So this is 38, um, that's to say 6-7, chapter 41. Know yourself is said to those who, because of their self's multiplicity, have the business of counting themselves up and learning that they do not know all of the number and kind of things they are, or do not know any one of them, nor what their ruling principle is, or by what they are themselves." End of quote. So to know oneself doesn't amount to grasp one's essence, unity, or identity, but to count up the multiplicity one is made of, to organize it into a hierarchy, and finally, to determine what, in this multiplicity, is properly ourselves. So we have here three distinct operations, which are as many successive declensions of the Delphi precept. Know how many you are. Know what rules in you. Know what in you is really you. Self-knowledge can be reached only at the end of this process of counting, hierarchization, and internal selection. For it requires indeed, as it very 
as its, as its very first condition, a conversion to interiority, which also is an estrangement from body, and from the utmost testimony of its union with the soul, that's a se sensation. Thus, as long as we exercise only our sense faculty, I quote, we do not know ourselves yet, since we know only a part of our soul, Morion Psyches, whereas we are, writes Plotinus, the whole soul. This is in Treatise 10, 5.1. In order to get a perception, antilepsis, of this lat latter, the whole soul, we need to turn our power of apprehension inwards, ace to ace. Thus, even, even though it presupposes a conversion to interiority, self-knowledge self is not conjunction with a unity. What this conversion allows to grasp is the whole soul, that's to say, a plurality of powers, states, and operations. For instance, to quote the enumeration treatise 53, 1 1, opens with pains and pleasures, fears and audacities, passions, opinion, reasonment, and thought. But also the very principles of reality, soul, intellect, and the one good. For, writes Plotinus, the three realities also exist in us. In us, not as sensible beings, but as identical with what Plato calls the inner man. This is also in uh, uh, Treatise 10, uh, 5 1. Plotinian interiority is therefore at once plural, stratified. It is made of the several powers which form a human soul, but also of the traces left in it by what is superior to it, intellect and the one good. Plotinus nonetheless admits, and this is an essential and uh, singular point, an immediate grasp of the self, or rather of the we, the hemais, by himself. More precisely, he formulates in two different places a reflexive question. At the end of the above quoted enumeration, Treatise 53 opens with, he asks, I quote, that which acts as overseer and carries out the investigation and comes to a decision about those matters, what sort of thing is it? And in Treatise 22, uh, 6 4, we find another text which opens with this strange question, but we, who? So what emerges here for the first time in Greek philosophy is indeed an immediate reflexivity, a relationship of the hemais to himself, which neither requires another subject, like in Plato, nor an object, like in Aristotle. However, this immediate relation to oneself does not amount to self-knowledge. Or rather, it can only be related to the first moment of self-knowledge as above distinguished, that is, the grasp of a multiplicity. This is why the reflexive question doesn't carry, in, doesn't carry its answer in itself, unlike what happens in Descartes. Uh, asking, but we, who we, is not enough to know who we are. The Hemais doesn't catch himself uh, in his essence through his capacity to be conscious of himself. This capacity doesn't teach him anything about himself, doesn't give him access to his essence, nor to his identity. So in other words, self-consciousness at the level of the soul is not self-knowledge. So I now come to uh, the superior level, that is that of um, the intellect, self-knowledge in the intellect. If for Plotinus, the Hemais self-consciousness, that is our self-consciousness, does not amount to self-knowledge, it's because the Hemais essence, the peculiar intellect and separated soul, lies above us in the, princip in the principal intellect, which, by the way, is not the principal Buddha intellect as written in the summary, having the get something, you know, something strange happened here. Um, so the principal intellect is not Buddha intellect. Self-knowledge, that is real knowledge of the real self, can therefore only be found at the level of the intellect. But here, we have another dissociation, symmetrical of the one I already underlined. At the level of the Hemais and of Dianoia and uh, discursive soul, self-consciousness goes without self-knowledge. At the level of the intellect, self-knowledge goes without self-consciousness. 
More precisely, uh, in the intellect, self-knowledge goes without reflexivity. Reflexive consciousness must leave room to another kind of consciousness, which doesn't introduce any distance between subject and object. I quote from Treatise 31, uh, 5, 8. This is a sort of intimate understanding, the Greek says, synesis, and perception uh, of a self, synesis, which is careful not to depart from itself by wanting to perceive too much. This non-reflexive non consciousness is the only one which amounts to self-knowledge. I quote again from the same treatise, we have no perception of what is our own, and since we are like this, we understand ourselves best when we have made our self-knowledge one with ourselves. In the intellect, consciousness is pure presence to and pure identity with oneself, but with oneself as divine and not anymore as man. Now, um, self-knowledge can also be predicated of the principal intellect itself. More precisely, more precisely, it has to, since uh, intellect, like soul, is a multiple being, although intellect is more unified than soul is. Plotinus, well, this is a bit technical, but it's quite important uh, for Plotinus. Plotinus, he's here has to confront two aporias, one uh, formulated by Sextus Empiricus, according to which it is impossible for a compound being, and particularly for the intellect, to get knowledge of itself, um, briefly, the Aporia uh, states that either you know as a whole, and in this case you have nothing more to know, or you know only by your part, and then you don't get uh, real knowledge. The other Aporia, formulated by Plato in the Carmides, uh, is that according to which um, self-knowledge would be an empty object lacking science. The solution, which I can't develop here, of both Soporia rests, and Plotinus, on the reusing of the Aristotelian notion of energia. This enables Plotinus to set down the identity of intellect with its act, intellection, as well as, as with the object of this act, being, and the intelligible. Sextus Aporia about self-knowledge can thus be dismissed, but Plot Plotinus also answers by the same way to uh, Plato's, to, to the Carmides Aporia. Self-knowledge is not an empty reflexivity. It is not only knowledge that one knows, but knowledge that one is, or more precisely, knowledge by the intellect of the totality of the intelligibles and of Ousia. Okay, so I come to my last part, uh, Plotinus self and the know um, thyself. And some conclusive remark. Uh, despite the above noted uh, differences, uh, there is a common structure of self-knowledge and self-consciousness at the level of the MS and at that of the intellect. First, it must be underlined, um, and this is, of course, another huge difference with Descartes, that the Hemais is not a substance, is not an ousia. Only the separated soul for Plotinus can be considered as ousia, insofar as it is both essential and capable of subsisting without body. But the Hemais cannot be equated with consciousness either, actually. In Treatise 10, Plotinus only said that we are linked to consciousness. No more than with, than with consciousness can the Hemais be identified with Dianoia. Once again, it is only associated to it. In Treatise 53, Plotinus writes about uh, Dianoia, opinion and reasoning, that this is precisely where we mostly are. So we have here a situation, not a definition. And in the same Treatise, the Hemais is designated not as consciousness, nor as Dianoia, but as that which gives an orientation to its consciousness. That's to say, as that which decides to be conscious of, and therefore to actualize, either the inferior or the superior powers of the soul, either, either sensation or pure thought, either the animal or the god. This is why I called uh, the Plotinian Hemais elsewhere a subject without identity, by which I don't mean that he is an empty place, uh, nor a mere potentiality, but a power of choice and identification. Becoming, that's to say, choosing to be conscious of one or the other power of the soul amounts to actualizing it and identifying with it. Plotinus' formula of the self is not, I think, therefore I am, 
as long as I am conscious that I am thinking, but rather I become what I am conscious of, what I decide to be conscious of, either the animal or the god. So we have here a practical rather than cognitive relation to oneself. The Delphic uh, precept should be understood as a practical imperative, a become what you are rather than know who you are. Knowing oneself or Plotinus is not as much knowing what, ins what oneself is as knowing where one comes from. I quote from Plotinus 9, 6, 9, he who has learned to know himself will know from whence he comes. And this is true for the soul and for the intellect, since to know itself for the intellect is to know its own inadequacy to the one. Self-knowledge, therefore, is not closure, nor perfer perseverance into oneself, like the Stoic uh, oikiosis, but rather relation of the self with what exceeds it. For this reason, the Delphi precept appears as an invitation, uh, not as much uh, to humility and to know uh, one's limits, which, as is well known, was probably his first uh, meaning. Um, the know that self was, was linked, for instance, to the Meden Agan, uh, nothing in excess. So it's not as much uh, for Plotinus an invitation to know one's limits as to overpass them. We don't have as much to coincide with ourselves as to conform ourselves to an excess. Not as much to secure our identity as to identify with what we come from. We don't have to know what we are, but rather what we can be and which both exceeds and founds us. Thank you. Thank you, Wernel. I'll do like this. I will save my questions for the panel discussion when I bring all the okay. three up because I'm quite anxious to right. give Jim O'Donnell his 15 minutes as well. Grande profundum est ipse homo. A few weeks ago, I was checking in to a hotel in Florence on the Piazza Ognisanti. A lovely square right on the Lungarno, a couple of blocks west of the uh, Ponte Vecchio. And as I came out of the hotel a few minutes later, looking for a grocery store to buy some soft beverages for less than hotel prices, I suddenly saw the church on the square and knew that I had to dart inside as fast as I could and take a picture. Because that church houses one of the four most famous rep artistic representations of St. Augustine, Botticelli, no less. And here I was staying half a block from Botticelli's Augustine. So I went in, I took my picture, and I posted it on Facebook. When I posted it on Facebook, I said, now I don't believe in selfies, and I'm pretty sure Augustine didn't either. But since he and I have been friends for such a long time, and when we're being brought together under the patronage of Botticelli no less, I think we can make a partial exception. This is the partial exception. As soon as I posted it, a very old friend, now distinguished professor of medieval Hanseatic trade at the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg, wrote in and said, what, don't you think the confessions are a selfie? The conversation went from there, but I decided to make that my starting off point today so that you can begin to think whether you agree with him or whether you accept my skepticism on that point. Um, I begin with this because Augustine began the career that we can see and read, inscribing himself very deeply, as deeply as he could, in the traditions of ancient philosophy. We have an earlier work uh, on the beautiful and the fitting, which was lost, uh, written in his Manichaean days. But the earliest works he wrote in the winter of 386, 387, were written at the point when he had decided in that garden in Milan that it was possible indeed for him to become a philosopher. Because for him, to become a philosopher meant accepting baptism and all that baptism brought with it. This is a somewhat idiosyncratic position, uh, but it derives from, among other things, Ambrose's own book, De Philosophia Siwe De Regeneratione Animae. On philosophy, that is to say, on baptism. Augustine believed that the continence, the chastity, the celibacy that he was embracing at long last was a necessary component of that life as a philosopher. 
He went away to a country house, or place rather like this lovely setting, for the winter of 386-387, in order to explore his destiny as a philosopher, and, I believe, to take himself out of the way of some of the temptations that his chastity might encounter if he stayed in the big city uh, where, he had been, where he had been living. So in that period, uh, he writes soliloquies, treatise on the academics, treatise on the happy life, treatise on providence. And here you see from the soliloquies, he invented, by the way, the word soliloquium, but his soliloquy was a dialogue between him and his ratio, his reason. Um, you see his programmatic tasks. Um, God ever the same, let me know myself, let me know you. Uh, it's God and the soul I want to get to know. Nothing else, that's reason interjecting, nothing at all. That process of self-knowledge is carried out there by a philosopher who knew too little and had a Dunning-Kruger estimation of his abilities as a philosopher. He hadn't read enough. He hadn't had the right teachers. Um, his light, leading philosopher was Cicero. He is, in fact, the most serious student of Cicero's philosophical works we know of from antiquity. Uh, what he knew of Greek philosophy was too little, and he had recently bathed in what must have been the forbiddingly difficult Latin translations of something of Plotinus by Marius Victorinus. Um, there are days on which I wish we did have Mar Marius Victorinus translations of Plotinus, and other days on which I am grateful that we do not, because I know just exactly how much trouble they would cause us. But Augustine went away from Cassiciacum, he took baptism, he went back to Africa. He tried to find, let's say, himself. Was ordained a priest rather against his will, to hear him tell it, in 391. And at that point began to try to find the life of a Christian philosopher baptized and ordained. It took him some years. At that point, however, in 391, writing another mostly philosophical work, with the puzzling title of De Utilitate Credendi, on the usefulness of believing. He is skeptical about the ability of one writer to make any sense to another audience of what he was inside. But six years later, uh, in his confessions, he sets out to do something, call it selfie or no, to describe the self he has been, the self he is, and the self that he wants to be. He does this to break a writer's block. It's hard to imagine Augustine of the five million surviving words having a writer's block, but indeed he did. Um, he couldn't finish a book to save his life in the early 390s. The, confe <clears throat> Sorry. the Confessions is the first substantial book from Augustine's pen that he actually finished and carried out, and it made it possible for him then to break forth with a series of anti-Manichaean and theological and exegetical works over the next years, and to become the Augustine whom, whom we know. But in those confessions, when we find him exploring who he is himself, he has a doctrine and a puzzle. His doctrine is that man, ideal man, man sinless, man perfect, man ready for salvation, is created in the image and likeness of God. To the extent that he fits that likeness, he is suitable for divine presence. To the extent that he falls away from it through sin, something needs to happen. The narrative books of the Confessions are his account of the something that needed to happen. I will take you through, they're in the program uh, for you to look at, but briefly, the leitmotif passages that I've extracted from the Confessions that talk a little bit about what it was like to try to know himself. Um, man is a great abyss. The moods and attractions of his heart far outnumber the hairs of his head. Uh, when he's been reading Libri Platonicorum, probably Marius Victorinus translations, um, he is struck, he is blinded, he's shivering between affection and apprehension. I realized how far away I was still in the land of unlikeness. Dissimilitudo there has a platonic uh, uh, provenance, but it also echoes his belief that he should be in the land of similitudo, not dissimilitudinous. So he finishes his narrative in nine books, and he sets out to describe who he is. His ambition? To know God, his knower, to know God as he is known himself. 
And this becomes the standing theme for Augustine's self-knowledge. He doesn't have it. God has the knowledge of him, which is the defining, shaping, and creating knowledge. He is not who he thinks he is. He is who God thinks he is. So a few pages later, he makes the painful admission that though he has been converted, though he has been baptized, though he is ordained, though he is a bishop, he still lives in a world in which he does not know to which temptation he will submit next. And he uses the rest of book 10 in which he is describing the self whom he is at that point in order to do what many readers find a very painful and detailed and obsessive compulsive examination of conscience Structured in a Trinitarian way, he has sinned with one respect to the God the Father, with another respect to God the Son, with another respect to God the Spirit, and he still faces those temptations day in and day out. The confessions, in other words, seeming to be a portrait of self, are by the time Augustine's intellectual honesty, his loyalty to the academic skepticism he had learned from Cicero, Due to those factors, they are a portrait of what he, that he cannot paint. It is a presentation. He leaves it to his audience to make of that presentation what they will. But the divine knower is still the one who knows that self. Um, Augustine's later influence is mainly not among philosophers. Medieval Christian philosophy, by and large, abandoned Augustine's uh, ways of thinking largely because they embraced his other ways of thinking. He was a master of exegesis, and he also drove himself and others nuts by his obsessive pursuit of the person I call the Saddam Hussein in his career, I mean Pelagius, uh, the war he didn't need to fight, uh, the war that left him battered and bruised and needing explanation from all successive generations. But Augustine in after generations is mainly, for many centuries, the exegete, and to a lesser extent, the Pauline exegete who needs to be nuanced and subtleized and made excuses for in order to keep him uh, inside the fence. Augustine the philosopher, the kind of philosophy he thought he was creating, the kind of philosopher he thought he was, the sort of philosopher that he wanted to be, leaves behind few traces in the Latin Christianity that read him. Claudianus Mamertus in the late fifth century is, to my eye, the last you might count. Some would count Boethius, but Boethius certainly knew a great deal more about philosophy than Augustine did. Had read many more books. Had read some Augustine, uh, but is an independent performer. Uh, in many ways. Augustine himself lends himself to mysticism, and I suspect we'll be hearing something of that afterlife from Professor Van Dyke in a few minutes. So what do we make of someone who set out to know himself, who fails to know himself, who has a reputation uh, for being an expert on interiority and self-knowledge? I will leap forward to conclude. Nietzsche hated Augustine, absolutely despised him. Now, there's a lovely page on which he makes fun of the pear tree episode from book two of the Confessions. I recommend it. He has a lot of fun with it in the way that only Nietzsche can have fun with it. But it is striking that the Augustinian tradition in philosophy became of interest again in the 20th century to two of Nietzsche's most powerful disciples, Heidegger and Foucault. Both of them busied themselves with his work, uh, took them seriously. Heidegger used to walk over the hills from Meskirch to the Arch Abbey of Boiron, the Benedictine Abbey uh, on the Upper Donau, uh, there to deliver lectures on time and memory in the confessions to the assembled monks. We have those. We can now try to think what those assembled monks made, uh, made of them. But it's in that spirit of seeing what happens when you reopen Augustine that I quoted in the program book for this and put it here. Some famous words, now it's hard to realize, more than 50 years old. From the last page of Foucault's Les Mots et les Choses, uh, The Order of Things, in which, with less necessity of complying with Christian orthodoxy, and more of a recognition that I think can be connected to Augustine's, he looks forward for us to a future in which the underlying notion of what a human being is, with which I think we begin the process of exploring ancient self-knowledge, taking for granted the ancient process of self-knowledge, naturalizing it, 
uh, that that fundamental underlying anthropology is itself vulnerable and capable of being blown away. To that end, I am surprised that in our discussions today, there has been no mention or discussion that I have registered of contemporary developments in the study of the self and self-knowledge, that is to say, work done by brain scientists and cognitive psychologists. If we listen to them, and I listen to them mainly as an amateur, I think we recognize that many of the assumptions that we, in a vernacular way, take for granted about human beings simply do not work. One only I will instance, and that is current research, which suggests that human beings do have autonomous volition. I'm not saying free will, I'm saying autonomous volition. But that that autonomous volition ex exercises itself unconsciously. That is to say, they do brain scans that show that the moment at which the decision is taken antecedes the moment at which the consciousness thinks it's taking the decision. Who then are we, what are we, if that is how we make our choices? We've discovered now in many ways that we have to live in a world in which identity, to say nothing of gender, to say nothing of ethnicity, to say nothing of other formerly intrinsic qualities of human beings, need to be recognized for having a constructed quality, for having a lability, uh, for having an evanescence that can, in fact, uh, look forward to the possibility of disappearing in the way that Foucault anticipates. So when they asked me for a work of art to go with this presentation, um, I went for Bellini's portrait of Mehmet II. Um, on the one hand, it's an important document in the history of Western perception of the East. Um, it is the Italian Renaissance painter depicting the Muslim, the Turk, the monster. But it has another famous afterlife. When it was taken up by Marcel Proust in La Recherche du Temps Perdu, as reminding him of no one so much as Odette's lover and husband, the Jew in the jockey club, Charles Swann. So I thought it was appropriate to end with a portrait that captures uh, the possibility of multiple identities in the same representation and the doubts to which I think it is that Augustine leads us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Not least for the deeply worrying end of your presentation. We, we can talk about artificial intelligence and algorithms in a few moments' time, but First, we have our last speaker, Christina van Dijk. There you are. Can I know myself? Practical advice for medieval contemplatives. Okay, so knowing that I was gonna be last, I not only brought you pictures, I'm gonna make four main points and they're all gonna be very clearly labeled. So first off, um, one thing you may have noticed, but may well have not, is that in all of the discussions so far, the voices that we've been hearing are men. And you might start to wonder whether women had anything to say about themselves or the concept of self-knowledge. And so I'm happy to report that at least in the period of the sort of high to late Middle Ages in the Latin Christian West, there was an explosion of discussions about self-knowledge and that women had a great deal to say. So I'm actually gonna be quoting from a variety of different people in part so that you get a sense of just how broadly spread these ideas are and how many voices there are to hear them from. Many of which we simply don't talk about in philosophy yet. <laughs> All right. so. The opening sentence of a very popular book of meditations in the 12th century, or 13th century, it says the following, many know much, but do not know themselves. And you might wonder, and so? I mean, at this point in events, clearly you know that this is a topic that many people were highly interested in, but 
in the Latin Christian West, there was a, not only the tradition from philosophy, but then also following in the Neoplatonic and the Augustinian line, this idea that self-knowledge was not just a good thing, but the actual foundation for any future spiritual or moral progress for two particular reasons. First, as I say here, self-knowledge is described as the ground in which humility roots itself and from which all the other virtues grow. So putting aside that there are a number of medieval mystics who want to make the claim that ultimately we need to transcend virtue entirely, to surrender our wills and kind of have a self-abnegation, everybody agrees that self-knowledge is the necessary first point. And then second, self-knowledge is a precondition for achieving our ultimate end as human beings. Those of you who aren't religious might be glad to know that this doesn't just have to do with union with God, although that is, of course, the highest aim, and that's where I'm going to be concluding the talk, but it also just includes any kind of a flourishing life here on earth. All right, so I'm going to talk about four different practical recommendations that medieval contemplatives offer to their readers, which is everyone. Um, they weren't situated in the university setting, and so they're not writing to an elite audience. These are people that expect anyone who maybe can have it read to them, if not read it themselves, to be able to follow the kind of instructions that they're giving. So the one particularly um, graphic, vivid piece of advice comes from the anonymous 14th century English book, the Book of Privy Counseling, and it recommends gnawing on the naked blind feeling of thine own being. So this is a, a picture that I took at a museum in Volterra, Italy, um, that quite graphically depicts gnawing on yourself. Um, and the thought is, in order to have knowledge of yourself, the first thing you need to do is have an awareness of your attachment to yourself. Hadwich, um, who I have to say, I'm, I'm finishing now a book on medieval contemplatives um, and philosophy, she's amazing and deserves far more attention than she's gotten. So she's a 13th century Flemish Beguine, which means that she's, she doesn't take vows, she's not a nun, but she's part of a dedicated lay religious order, and she writes a lot of letters to her fellow Beguines. So she goes on at length, learn to know yourselves. How? Well, you needed your attraction, aversion, behavior, love, hate, fidelity, mistrust, all things that befall yourself. And then, I'm not going to read this, but she basically goes on to say that the way to do this is to pay attention to how you think you're going to react when bad things happen, and then how you actually react when bad things happen how you think you're going to behave when something pleasant occurs, and how you actually behave when something pleasant occurs. So you get this sort of very concrete advice, and we'll see by the end of the talk to what purpose. Okay, recommendation two, let go of selfish love. So the injunction to look in on yourself and to recognize the extent of attachment to yourself when you complete that process, or as part of that process, what you begin to realize is that you're attached to yourself in all kinds of ways that are what medievals kind of characterize as selfish love. Um, by which they mean you want, it's very Aristotelian, as Terry mentioned, you want the most pleasure, you want the most honor, you want the most stuff. And what Meister Eckhart counsels is examine yourself and wherever you find yourself, take leave of yourself. I mean, it's very pithy. It's very, you know, paradoxical in the way that Eckhart is. Um, Catherine of Siena, much more direct. <laughs> Knowledge of yourself, 
leads you to shed the cloud of selfish love. And so she talks at various points about how our attachment and love for ourselves literally clouds our ability to think clearly and relate to God. So you have to let go of that. How? Knowledge of yourself. So um, in particular, we've talked a little bit in a couple different talks about body and soul. Here, she says, after the soul comes to know herself, she finds humility, one of these concepts that's appeared in a number of talks, and she rises up with hatred and contempt for her selfish, sensual passion which sounds very you know, dirty and Augustinian. But really, she just means any of the kind of inappropriate attachments to wanting things for yourselves more than for others or in inappropriate ways. And what do you do? You crush it firmly under the foot of reason. So this beautiful sort of metaphor of, of crushing this temptation. And then Hadwich agree is saying our beautiful faculty of reason instructs us in all our ways and enlightens us in all our works. If we would follow reason, we would never be deceived. I mean, strong claim, and of course she tempers it in various ways, but the point remains, how are you supposed to get rid of the selfish love that you've discovered? Prudence, right? You're thinking about it, you're recognizing it, and you're making wise choices. All right, third, and this this is a particularly interesting one insofar as it relates to how self-knowledge is not a lonely project. So the third recommendation is don't forget that self-knowledge coming to an awareness of who you really are and therefore what you can be requires others. So the people that are writing the text that I'm studying all live in communities. This isn't a time where people go off into the desert and meditate. This is a time where you're meditating surrounded by your fellow, I mean, community members, begin, nun, monk, layperson, what have you. So self-knowledge is meant to be one part of a rich spiritual life that includes regular practices such as Lectio Divina, where you read a piece of scripture, a religious text repeatedly, and you think about what you're hearing. You don't even actually have to read it. A lot of times it was spoken because this tradition doesn't assume that you're literate. So there would have been plenty of Beguines who couldn't read and write. And so somebody would read this out loud and you would meditate, like you would think about it. And then you would meditate, which has a very particular definition for this time period. It doesn't mean Buddhist meditation. It's not a sort of emptying of yourself or emptying of your mind. Instead, meditation was imaginatively placing yourself at certain events in the narrative of of Christ's life in particular, but it could be sort of a variety of spiritual settings, placing yourself imaginatively, say, at the birth of Christ as a way of engaging affection and emotion and kindling the love that then is going to drive you towards sort of further devotion. So prayer, also a big part of this. And then also, so that's one part of like the communal life. Everybody in your community is engaging these same practices. It obviously also requires regularly checking in with others to balance your self-assessment. And this is something that the tradition has um, I mean, I love the idea about the, the ritual as like the subversion of like habits, right? When Jan Brunner was talking about, no, who was talking about that? Michael. 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 It's been a very long day. When Michael was talking about that, right? Because that's exactly how this is meant to function. You have these normal patterns of thought. You have these normal patterns of behavior. So what do you do? You introduce regular practices that move you out of that and you do it with other people around you 
who can help kind of keep you honest. And so you have this embedded practice of spiritual advisors, confessors, prudent friends like Hadvich who's writing. Catherine writes 300 or more letters in the course of her very short life, most of which are giving very pointed pieces of advice to people like the Pope. Uh, she tells him literally to man up at one point <laughs> and move back to Rome. So finally, and I love how this fits with what Sarah was talking about, um, the fourth recommendation that leads us to an answer to why we should want to know ourselves is that you need to root down in humility in order to rise up. And it's always got to be that direction and never just once, of course, right? You have to continually do this. Because if you think of the metaphor, Catherine of Siena, for example, uses the metaphor of a tree with the roots, right? You don't kind of pull those up. You keep those there. And the deeper they go and the more nourished they are, the higher the tree is going to grow and the healthier it's going to be. And so that's supposed to be, there's, it's, it's the most persistent metaphor in all of the contemplative literature that I've run into is this idea about the self as a tree. And you often get these ideas, virtues are the fruit, you know, humility is the roots. And so for somebody like Hadvich, when she talks about humility, she has an entire letter, letter 12 about this. She talks about it as the worthiest and purest place in which we can receive love. In other words, when we think of humility, I think in contemporary discussions, we often think about it in terms of, of sort of self-loathing. It's when you think what a horrible, crappy person you are. And it's very important to see that although you get kind of some of that language, it's always meant to be a way of getting to your ground so that you can receive love. It's never for the purpose of feeling bad about yourself, right? And so, um, I mean, look at what she says humility is going to get you, right? To this end, you must remain humble and unexalted by all the works you can accomplish. You can accomplish a lot of works. Uh, but wise, with generous and perfect charity to sustain all things in heaven and earth, then you can become perfect and possess what is yours. I mean, that's a very strong claim. All right. So this is a, a if you've been to the museum, the Cluny Museum in Paris, this is the, one of the unicorn tapestries, and it picks up on the mirror metaphor that we've been getting. And so Catherine here says, as the soul comes to know herself, she also knows God better. In the gentle mirror of God, she sees her own dignity. So again, you get the pairing of humility and dignity that through no merit of hers, but by his creation, she is the image of God. And then the very final quote I have is from Julian of Norwich, who's a late 14th century English anchorite. And the, the, the whole quote here is sort of a summary of what we've been talking about all day. The idea that you can have self-knowledge, we can continue to grow, but we're never going to know ourselves completely until the moment of death. Right? So for Julian, this is great because at the moment of death, then the fulfillment of this knowledge, we shall clearly and truly know our God in the fullness of never ending joy. So the ultimate rewards of self-knowledge is nothing short of the fulfillment of never ending joy in the creator of the self in the first place. Thank you. Julian of Norwich and Christina summarized this day in a very beautiful way. Good, Please, you. now, the panel, where are the other two speakers yeah. in this session? Uh, normally at Engelsberg, we have seminars with the theme, the, the past, the present, and the future. We have talked much about the past. We have talked a little about the present, but very little, James, about the future. And you touched upon this brain research, algorithms, 
there is someone who has more knowledge about ourselves than we do and someone, somebody, something that can predict our actions more accurately than we will be able to do. What, final question, what will happen with the self in the future? <laughs> <laughs> I have a thought experiment I like to try on people like you. Um, a, a book has now been written, in fact, by an artificial intelligence program uh, in a computer. Um, if you want to know the current state of research on lithium-ion batteries, this is the book you should read. So my thought experiment is, it's 20 years from now, and you are a graduate student working on self-knowledge in Plotinus. Um, and you have gathered together all of your materials, and there is a single button on your computer screen that says, Dissertation. <laughs> and you push that button, and a very recognizable dissertation comes out. The thought experiment question is, would you accept that dissertation in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy or not? If not, why not? When I, what do you think will happen That's with just the... That's answering a question <laughs> of the question. <laughs> okay. What's the answer? Oh, I think you will. But I think you will have a lot of trouble getting yourself to that point to do so. Mm. I feel um, like the AI but, gets the but by that point, partial fulfillment. By that point, well, but the AI isn't a person, is it? Well, anyway. Mm. Um, no, do we come to a point at which pushing the button and having a document generated mm. feels to that person the way it felt to me the first time I hit print on a computer in 1983 and didn't have to keep retyping over and over and over and over again. Um, if I had had a computer before I started my dissertation, I would be two years younger than I am today. <laughs> <laughs> What's the purpose? What's the purpose of being two years younger? Yeah. <laughs> You're uh, two I, years wiser. I, mm. could, I could come to more places like... When I, is, is the self being diluted by well, the mm. algorithms, artificial intelligence, <laughs> neurology? Well, I don't think so. I mean, what, what I, I mean, together with this apparent delusion, there is also a huge narcissistic inflation, obviously, in, uh, in contemporary society. And then we didn't have to wait uh, cognitive sciences to get uh, uh, I mean, criticisms of the self. Um, um, you, 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 uh, you mentioned Nietzsche, uh, Foucault, uh, Heidegger. What I find interesting is that uh, all those criticisms actually um, build uh, a sort of Cartesian, uh, actually aim at, at, at Descartes, they all, and they actually rebuild Descartes, what we call Descartes, uh, Descartes' conception of the self, is actually a historical construction in which uh, all those criticisms by Kant, by Husserl, by Nietzsche, uh, play a very important part. So what I find interesting, and what it's more or less what mm. has been done today, is that there are other, alter there are alternative conceptions of the self, uh, which were, I mean, which today have been described uh, very precisely in very different fields. Uh, the idea of multiple selves, the idea of non-substantial -subs non self, I and mean, the, the hemace, you see the, 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 the Platinian hemace, for instance, is, non is not substantial. Um, he's reflexive and not substantial. In Plotinus, you have all the elements of the Cartesian complex, mm. which, which, which are dissociated. And uh, actually, those pre-Cartesian conceptions of the self uh, at least for what, what I know, that's the self of Plotinus, uh, are strangely uh, reactivated uh, in contemporary uh, thought, for instance, in Deleuze. Um, Foucault never quotes Plotinus, but when Foucault writes about uh, depersonalization, for instance, um, he's very close uh, to Plotinus. Uh, I'm much more interested, actually, in, uh, in those processes of depersonalization yeah. and impersonalization uh, than of those processes mm. of, uh, well, um, let's say, narcissism and construction of a mm. robust self, as, a, right. as we have earlier. Many yeah. different, many selves, many different selves, many new sorts of selves in the future. Um, so I actually have a what might be a very different take, which is one thing that's really struck me is how common concerns and thoughts arise in every single person that we've read. And you asked earlier about the relevance of Socrates for today. 
And my students, when they read him, they know exactly what he's talking about mm. when he says the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm. And I think that our conception, like how we express the self might be radically different. Um, and I think that goes to your thought question about like thought experiment about whether we would consider the dissertation that generates itself as enough of the product of your thought. But I think that the, the fundamental core that people turn to is just a, a sort of constant throughout human history. It'll express itself in different ways, but you know, you go and look at the, the pyramids in Giza yeah. and you see people scratching their names and taking selfies, right? Like it's, it's just the technology changes, but the impulses I think remain fundamentally the same. Mm. I'm going to thank you, all the other speakers, the audience yeah. and the organizers by reading a short poem on self-knowledge by the Swedish poet Thomas Tronströmer, translated by his friend Robert Bly, American poet. It's called Romanesque Arches. Tourists have crowded into the half dark of the enormous Romanesque church, vault opening behind vault and no perspective. A few candle flames flickered. An angel whose face I couldn't see embraced me and his whisper went all through my body. Don't be ashamed to be a human being. Be proud. Inside you, vault after vault opens endlessly. You will never be complete and that is as it should be. Tears blinded me as we were herded out into the fiercely sunlit piazza, together with Mr. and Mrs. Jones, Hertanaka, and Signora Sabatini, within each of them, vault after vault opened endlessly. Mm.